Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I've got a really fascinating person uh, to uh, introduce you to tonight. Uh, Lavender Morantz, is that correct pronunciation, Morantz? Lavender Morantz, yeah. Lavender, not Lavender. I've done this before with you. Lavender uh, Morantz. Um, she is a ninth generation, if you can believe it, entrepreneur, and we're going to have to check her up on that and see if it's really true. Uh, a TEDx uh, speaker, I've heard her speak, and she's uh, very, very motivating. She's a coach, she's a mentor, she's a writer, she's a wellness specialist, an advocate. She empowers women to live their most abundant life in truth, wellness, and joy. That's what she says she does. So, Lavender, how are you? Welcome to our show. I'm well. Thank you for the super generous intro. <laughs> so, ninth generation entrepreneur? I don't believe it. Can you go back to your great, 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 great <laughs> grandfather or grandmother and tell me what they were doing? So, <laughs> I actually found out um, just out of like poking around for stories with my family. I was flying back um, from Salt Lake City on a business trip and I was thinking and I was like, I wonder you know, if my uh, allergy to like working corporate, this is just me personally, no judgment on anybody who loves corporate. That's totally cool. But for me, it was totally an allergy. So I, w I asked my mom and my dad and I said, you know, how many generations does this go back for us? Like who was the first entrepreneur in our family? And my dad said something like, I don't know, like three or four. And then my mom was like, no, 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 you're, you're number nine on her, on her side. I'm number nine in, in line for um, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> and did you ever get a sense of what all the different uh, entrepreneurial ventures were? So I didn't get all the details on everybody going back, but um, my mother is an optometrist. Uh, okay. She has her own practice here in Toronto. My mother's father, so my grandfather, um, was basically self-employed since the age of like nine. He was kicked out of a very big family back in Holland and had to fend for himself. And he started a bakery, um, basically like uh, mentoring with someone. And then it was his own business from there on out. And then any further back, um, my memory is a little blurry <laughs> on the details. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take it as given. Uh, three generations of entrepreneurs is good enough. Good enough. Um, uh, but uh, if it goes back nine, that really would be amazing. Though I, I think probably at one point in time in the, in the craft economy, um, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, everyone was an entrepreneur. And uh, unless you were a, uh, a Lord and had a whole bunch of people working for you. And even then maybe you were an entrepreneur, but I think a lot of people were, were entrepreneurs. So why is it that you love entrepreneurship? Um, I think that for my personality, um, and my interests, it just felt very aligned for me. Um, I like to kind of create my own life and sort of path. And it's really difficult to do when you work for someone else working with other people. However, there's a whole, you know, universe of things that you can collaborate to do and create. Um, so I just found entrepreneurship for me was, was the path I needed to take to be able to create the life that I was interested in living. So, and, you know, and so tell me about some of these entrepreneurial ventures right now. You, 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 what do you do? You, you, you say you're a, a uh, coach and a mentor and a writer and a wellness specialist and advocate. Tell me what you do in that regard. Yeah. So I have an online wellness space um, where I can build customized programs for people. Um, everything from um, food to skincare to supplementation to, um, you know, spiritual and mindful wellness. Um, and I've been doing that for a little over 10 years now. Um, but my first venture into entrepreneurship was actually um, with my design business. So that was my dipping the toe in the pond and um, starting that. And I did both simultaneously for a very long time. Um, my last uh, build was in 2015, 2016. Um, but since then, I've been very focused on um, the wellness space because I feel like that's really where... Um, society and you know the communities that I'm in touch with really need I think the most help and support and sense of community um, because I mean without our health and I mean we're seeing that now with the economy and with what's happening with um, you know everybody globally um, health really is the greatest wealth so that was really my passion for the last number of years for sure. And when you talk about health, what are you talking about? You're talking about diet, you're talking about exercise, you're talking about uh, you mentioned mindfulness so is it all of uh, it. 
All of it. Yeah, just aligned and holistic wellness, like top to bottom. So it could be everything from physical activity to, um, you know, do you have a mindfulness practice, practice, whether it's meditation or yoga or prayer or sitting in silence? Um, and what are you putting in your body? What are you feeding your cells? What are you putting on your body? Um, I, I know I've shared with you that I I had skin cancer when I was like 22 years old and you know, it, it doesn't take much digging to find out that what you put on your skin is in your bloodstream in less than 26 seconds. So just, really, yeah, just mindfulness um, as a holistic approach to um, overall wellness. And so uh, tell us what you do from a wellness standpoint. Yeah. So are you vegetarian or <laughs> vegan or? Oh, my personal practice. Oh man. Um, I definitely tried vegan. Um, for a number of weeks, and I actually found that I had personally had adverse effects to it. I do know that it's very aligned for a lot of people. A lot of people feel amazing going completely plant-based. So I have two daughters. So me and my girls are both, I would say, 85 to 90% plant-based. And then we have some, um, obviously, high-integrity, ethically sourced meats and seafoods in there as well. Um, I have like 240 uh, food sensitivities as well. <laughs> so, what? Yeah. 240 yeah. food sensitivities. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. I know. And I'm, um, I love food. So that was a very tough pill to swallow. Um, but I had so much inflammation and unanswered questions with my health a number of years ago that, um, I was just curious, like, are there things that my body maybe isn't in alignment with that I'm eating unknowingly? Like I was already very healthy but uh, I went and got tested for food sensitivities. And yeah, the big ones are pretty common across the board, like soy, dairy, gluten, corn. Um, but then there were other things like melon, um, pineapple, which was really sad because I love it. <laughs> um, but what I found was when I actually cleaned all those things out of my diet, I went completely cold turkey because I was just really desperate to feel good again. I know what feeling good feels like. Um, I was able to get my inflammation down and get my immune system working properly again. And I retested about two years after the original test and all of the really inflammatory foods had come down by about 20%, which means by eliminating them, I had allowed my um, immune system to work out the inflammation that was going on in my cells, which was really cool to see. So if people are interested in, in you, some of your health and wellness uh, activities and they want to contact you, how do they do that? Yeah, they can do that I, on basically all platforms. I have my website, lavendermorants.com. And then I'm also on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And there's uh, contact options through each of those pages as well. We're chatting tonight with Lavender Morantz about health and wellness and a bunch of other things uh, in her journey of life. We're going to take a break and come back uh, after a few messages in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I come to you every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock. Uh, I get to bring you some fascinating interviews, at least fascinating for me, with some uh, wonderful people. And tonight is no exception. We've got Lavender Morantz, who is a health wellness uh, expert. Um, she's got an online business, uh, and you can access uh, her uh, mentorship and coaching uh, and uh, suggestions and ideas uh, through her website, or uh, she's on Instagram, Facebook, and other things. Um, and she also does TED Talks. Uh, Lavender, what was your TED Talk about? My TED Talk uh, was actually called Let Your Struggle Set You Free. And uh, it's interesting now watching the world struggle that, you know, it was bang on. Um, but it really was just from the perspective of, you know, my journey and my, my findings through, you know, life and humankind. And how have your struggles got you, set you free? Um, I feel like if we allow the things um, that happen to us to, rather than make us um, a victim, um, allow them to shape us and let us grow into our true selves, there, there's really, there's always a silver lining there. It's like one of the quotes that I used in my TED talk was, the barns burnt down, now I can see the moon. So when you get all the crap out of the way, there's actually something really beautiful that comes from it if you're willing to look for that. Um, you know, let, let there be a lesson in all of the things that you go through and grow through. But the other cool thing about struggle is it is the one human connector. There's not a single person on this planet that has not struggled in some form or fashion. 
And so if you can see it from that light, that it does actually, even though you feel super vulnerable and want to kind of close yourself off when you're in the midst of struggle or stress, um, see it as that's what makes you human and what makes the next person human. And, you know, maybe you can use that to help somebody else or teach somebody else, or maybe just use it for yourself. Have you personally struggled? Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, from a lot of different aspects from, you know, health, from a health perspective, like I said, I, I had cancer at 22 and I mean, that's a pretty heavy diagnosis for anybody, but especially kind of when you're supposed to be in the prime of your life or just starting, um, I very easily could have, uh, you know, gone down that rabbit hole of victimhood. Um, but I chose to advocate for my health and to use that as kind of the redirect. Cause I also wasn't really living a life that I was like super in love with at that time. And it was a really big wake up call for me to, to really choose carefully how I spent my time and how I lived my life and how I treated my body and my relationships and the planet and so on and so forth. So explain um, uh, what you mean by you uh, weren't living a life that you were very happy with. Yeah. Um, I was kind of just on autopilot, to be honest. Um, I would wake up, go to work, um, a job I didn't love, uh, come home, go to bed, do it all over again. I wasn't mindful about the things I was eating at that time in my life. I ate a lot of junk food and fast food. And I mean, I could get away with it because I was fairly athletic, but that kind of stuff catches up with you. Like, yeah. did that contribute to cancer? It totally could have. I'm not sure. Was it, also, uh, you said it was skin cancer. So was it melanoma by the sun or something different? Yeah, it was melanoma. Um, and there were a bunch of different factors that contributed. Yeah, between um, sun, uh, tanning beds at the time, definitely uh, a few contributing factors. Really? Yeah. And, and you obviously got through it. So thank God. Yeah. Um, how did you get through it? Um, so number one one was really advocating for my own health. I went to three different dermatologists um, and I had gone in specifically because I had found um, a freckle that just looked different and to me felt different. I just trusted my gut and trusted my intuition to go and have it looked at. And two different dermatologists turned me away saying, doesn't meet the criteria for skin cancer. You're fine. Don't want to give you a scar for nothing. And something just wasn't sitting right. So um, I went to one more doctor and I pushed and I said, I don't care. Like, just please biopsy it. And sure enough, I got a phone call less than two weeks later um, while I was working. And uh, they're like, drop what you're doing. We're, we've got surgery ready for you. Uh, come on in. Really? And yeah. Had I, had That's it gone great another... they responded so quickly. Pardon? That's great they responded so quickly. It is great, but it was also because it was a very scary type of cancer, one that, you know, if you don't catch it soon enough um, or if it goes too long, you don't really recover from something like that. Right. Now, um, you have two girls. Were you a mother by then? I was not, no. So I had my first daughter, Winslow, when I was 29. And then I had Berkeley at 35. That's a big spread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, they're great. They get along really well. Um, they're happy, healthy little, little munchkins. And, uh, you know, I'm also grateful just back to the entrepreneur journey again. <laughs> I'm grateful that they can see kind of uh, how to make a life for themselves. Because a lot of kids, it's like, you know, their parents are at an office or at a job all day. And um, the fact that, you know, I work from home and I can incorporate, you know, them into my day because, you know, I'm the boss. So don't really have to ask anybody. <laughs> um, they really, they get, get a sense of, you know, what it takes to, to run a business and, and keep a family going. And, all of those things, they get exposed to a lot more than they would if I was going to an office all day, for sure. No, no question, for sure. And then I saw you post a whole bunch of things on Facebook about another illness that you had. Can you tell us about that at all? Yeah. So I had what's called breast implant illness. And that's actually what led to a lot of the food sensitivities that I had, which I was um, speaking to you earlier about. Um, and so I had implants for probably about five years. And now knowing what to look for, I would say I had symptoms of breast implant illness right from within like weeks of getting them. Really? And I thought it was I've, ne I've never heard of this until you started posting it. Okay. Um, so tell me about it if you could. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's basically an autoimmune response to putting something foreign in your body. And when you think about it, um, you know, you're sewing them into your body over your most vital organs, your heart, your lungs, and so forth. And so the second that that happens, your body starts, your immune system, if it's healthy, will start to try to reject what's there. And so some of the, the symptoms that happen as a result of this like rejection, essentially, is uh, inflammation, severe inflammation, um, other autoimmune diseases. Um, it can affect your hormones, your thyroid, uh, your skin, your sleep, your anxiety, your mental health. I have really? problems. Yeah, it's crazy. I had probably over 70, 70 of the like 80 to 90 symptoms personally. Now, I've never heard of this. So is, is this a, a, a brand new disease? Is it a warning that doctors provide to you before you get the implants? No. So it's definitely, it's not a brand new disease. There's actually um, a really great documentary on Netflix about implants in general, like surgical implants. Um, and they touch briefly on um, breast implants in that documentary as well, but it actually is a very common um, response. The problem is a lot of um, surgeon, surgeons and implant manufacturers don't, um, I think, fairly warn their patients in advance that that, that is not only a, a potential risk, but a very, very high risk. I'm part of a, a group on Facebook of, I think we're now almost at 200,000 women um, really? from across the globe, yeah, who have experienced um, minor to super severe reactions to implants, and um, most of whom are seeking or have gotten an explant, which is having the implant safely removed, including the capsule, your body forms of scar tissue to try to isolate the implant. So it's your body fighting against a foreign object, essentially. And is this uh, because of any different type of uh, implant, or is it because of specific no. types of implants? Unfortunately, it affects all types of implants, whether it's silicone, whether it's gel, whether it's cohesive or not. Um, mine were gel, and when they advertise them and show them to you, they literally like show you and you can like cut it and see that it doesn't fall apart. But the problem is the second it comes up to body temperature, which is different than room temperature, it's much, much higher, they turn to mush. So the slightest rupture and all of those 40 plus toxic um, neurotoxin chemicals that are in an implant is now in your system. So um, ruptured or not, they still do leach and leak those chemicals throughout um, their life, lifespan. Um, and so, you know, a lot of doctors promote, you know, yeah, they're good. You don't have to replace them for like 10 to 15 years. These are the new ones. You're totally safe. And that's not accurate. They are all extremely dangerous and toxic to your health. So why do you have them? Um, I didn't know at the time, to be honest. And when I got them, um, I mean, online forums and research weren't are as prevalent as they are now. And so about two years into having them, a girlfriend of mine um, texted me a link to an article about breast implant illness. And that was like the first kind of light bulb going off for me where I was like, okay, this might be something aligned with what's going on with me. Um, but I also at that point really didn't want to hear the information because <laughs> I didn't want to be wrong for having gotten them in the first place. I mean, it's a typical ego response, I guess. Yep, yep. Um, but the longer, um, I went with the symptoms I was having, the more undeniable it was that, you know, I literally checked every box. I had my blood work done. I checked my hormones. I cleaned up my diet. Like I said, with like the food sensitivities, I tried everything under the sun to um, get back to, like, I know what good health feels like, and I know what awful health, health feels like, and I was at the far, far end of the awful feeling spectrum. Um, my anxiety was through the roof. Um, I literally would drive my girls to school and have to come right back home and go to sleep because I could not function. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. And, yeah. and, and, and you, you said you've had them removed. Uh, what happened uh, since then? I did. So um, I got them removed at the end of, I'm just trying to think back here, the end of 2018. So December of 2018, I had them removed. And literally upon waking from surgery, 99% of my symptoms were gone. And one of the posts that I put up that you probably saw was I took a picture of my eyes going into surgery 
and waking up from surgery. So this is less than a 24 hour time span difference. And you can see the whites of my eyes are like totally clear and white again versus what they look like going into surgery. And it was just an instant relief from a lot of the inflammation. Um, there was a couple symptoms that took a little bit of time just to see if they rated themselves. Like I had a ton of hair loss. And as you can see, I've got a lot of hair. So it took a little while for it to see if it was actually really growing back in. And uh, I would say from about here up, the thickness is totally different than there. So it's all come back again. Um, my inflammation and weight had gone um, way, way, way up and it, that's all come back down again. But those two symptoms just took a little bit of time to iron out. Everything else was gone instantly. Unbelievable. I've never, other than, you know, the post that you did on Facebook and uh, this conversation, yeah. I'd never heard of this, uh, this uh, disease before. Yeah, it's crazy that it's not, um, I guess, more talked about and well-known, but I guess it's kind of a private issue too. So yeah. unless you personally know somebody or know an advocate for um, breast implant illness, uh, you wouldn't really, I guess, hear much about it. Um, this may be uh, personal, and so if you don't want to mention it, don't. But um, uh, you know, is there much scarring from the uh, what do you call it, the X X plant? Some, the X plant? No, and I mean, um, the surgeon I went to was um, very skilled in X plant specifically, so he knew how to take not only the implant out but also the, the scar tissue capsule around it, because um, even just leaving the scar tissue capsule behind, the symptoms can stay. So really? he was, he was very, very skilled. Um, I had drains in for about six days after the explant. Um, and my scars are like barely noticeable. Like my, my skin cancer scar is more noticeable than the explant scars. So. Well, it sounds like well. it uh, was, is the right decision. Um, yeah. and, uh, you're a single mom. Is that a struggle as well? Um, yes and no. It, it definitely, uh, is difficult and it's um, a lot of work, but I mean, they're worth it. Or as they will tell you, I chose them. So yep. <laughs> it's my own fault. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely um, a lot of work, but it, again, it is something that I chose. So, and the alternative is like, what do you do? Stay in a relationship or marriage that, that isn't right? I don't think that that's the right example either for, for children, you know? So you had all these different struggles. How did you get through it? What's the secret to your resilience? Oh, resilience. That's a great word. Um, I think that I've just got, uh, I've got a good mindset, um, but that didn't necessarily come naturally. I think that I'm naturally a very um, positive, um, bright, happy person, but the mindset around um, being able to work through something when it feels like it's not working or when it feels like the universe is totally against you, um, I built that through my entrepreneurship journey. I mean, you, you've got to be um, a little bit thick skinned, um, but you also have to have a really deep kind of faith and vision for where you're going so that, you know, when you're going through hell, you don't stop there, right? You want to move on out of that area. <laughs> Well, that's good advice. When you're going through hell, don't stop there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're chatting tonight with Lavender Morantz, a health and wellness expert. We're going to take a break for a couple of messages and come right back uh, with a little bit more with her. Stay with us. Well, we're back on the Brian Crumby Radio Hour with uh, Lavender Morantz, a health and wellness expert. Uh, Lavender, uh, remind me, what's uh, the website called? LavenderMorantz.com lavendermorantz.com and she's also on Facebook and Instagram and probably a whole bunch of other uh, social media places as well. Are you on TikTok yet? No, my daughter is trying to convince me and I refuse. <laughs> so you, you and your two daughters haven't done some funny TikTok dance yet? We, we do the dances. We just, I don't have the app and I, I don't necessarily think it's appropriate for a nine and a four-year-old to <laughs> be on, but they, they would argue. So you also told me that you left home when you were a teenager. I Tell did. me about that story. Yeah. So, um, I, again, you know, back to the, the struggle. I think that's like the common ground through this whole thing. Um, my parents went through a pretty uh, messy and ugly uh, divorce. Um, when I was growing up, I have three younger siblings. And then now I'm lucky and grateful to have two step siblings as well. 
Um, so it does have a happy ending, the story, but um, yeah, uh, it, it was really disruptive um, at that stage in my life. And I think I just, um, I re recognized that it was a little bit of a toxic environment for me. And if I was going to, you know, finish school and go on to um, either work or college or university, I ended up doing all of the above. But um, I knew that I had to have uh, a, an environment that I could focus and get through those things. So um, I moved out um, in my late teens and uh, I've been on my own ever since, really. So um, you moved out in your late teens um, and you said you were a designer. So you uh, what were designing buildings or homes or what? So no, so I initially was in corporate. So I was in corporate fashion as a buyer. I worked for everywhere from the Bay to Holt Renfrew to um, INC, which is International Clother Clothiers. Um, and uh, that's what I was doing when I initially when I initially moved out. And I actually I went to school for fashion um, at the Academy of Design. Um, and then I later went and I went back to Ryerson to upgrade my degree when I decided I wanted to start my design business um, for interior design, um, just because there was a lot of um, overlap there in terms of like, you know, color theory and just the whole design mindset, you could translate it from fashion to interior pretty, pretty easily. Um, so I went to Ryerson to upgrade my, my degree and then I launched uh, my design business. So there was a, a bit of a stretch in between there, a little, little under eight years in the fashion industry. And then I was just like, you know, fashion's a great hobby for me. I love it, but it's not a career for me. Right. Okay. So, you know, you left home, um, but you got over that uh, and got into school and got into the design business. Uh, you had cancer. Uh, you got over that. Um, you then, I presume, had a failed marriage, uh, even though you got two beautiful daughters out of it, uh, but you got over that. You then had this breast implant uh, um, disease and, and you got over that again. How do you get through all these problems? You Very said helpful. that the answer was not stopping in hell, but like there's gotta be more of a secret. Than that. <laughs> yeah, holy, well hearing it all back, it sounds like a, a, lot, a lot worse than it's felt step by step. And there's definitely been some amazing, amazing things in between. I think I've built a really great network of people around me too. I think community is so important. Um, you know, don't isolate yourself when you're in the middle of something hard or um, whether it's a struggle with your health or your relationship or just even like internal struggle, you know? Um, I think that's the whole like importance of having a community. Like you don't have to do it by yourself. And, uh, you know, I could take all the credit and say, you know, I'm just a strong person. And yes, I've definitely built some heavy duty muscles around struggle, but I would easily credit the people around me, my family, um, my really good friends, my business community. Um, they've all been a huge support through all of the things that I've grown through as well. How do you develop community? Um, I think that it's part um, choice, obviously relationships are a choice, but I think it's also, um, I think, hmm, that's a good question. I would say, you know, people come into your life for a reason and you can, you can tell when your energy is aligned with someone, you can tell when somebody has, uh, you know, good intentions for you. You can tell when, you know, your values are aligned with people and I've just, uh, I'm a really good judge of character for the most part. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I hold people close that, that have gone through life with me. Um, I've got friends from, you know, childhood, high school. And then I've also got friends I've made as an adult that have really just been absolutely incredible. I wouldn't trade them for anything. And you say that you've made these contacts not only with, you know, personal social friends, but business associates. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you I've do got, that? Is it different? Um, I mean, the, the process is the same. It's like, our, our, is our energy aligned? Um, like, you know, even, even meeting what, you. And what do you mean is your energy aligned? I don't understand that. Tell um, me what, how I do you know if your energy is aligned? I guess it's a little is, new is age. Our, is, our, woo -woo. is our energy aligned? How do I know I if our so. energy is aligned? Yeah. I mean, we've, we've been popping into each other's lives for the last uh, like two and a half years ish, I would say. Um, and I just feel like when, when you are, when you do feel aligned with somebody energetically, um, either through like shared values or 
um, a sense of integrity or your interests, then you see where that relationship goes, right? It's like some people kind of just drop off to the sidelines. Um, and then some people really like stand up and, and want to be there with you and for you through not only your wins, but your losses and your struggle too. They're not, it's not like a fair weather friend. They're people that stick around and that are interested in what you're doing and vice versa too. So do you think that one of the secrets to your resilience um, and getting through your tough times has been your relationships, your friendships? I would 100% say yes, absolutely. Because I think who you surround yourself with is just as important as the work that you do on yourself for whatever it be mindset or um, your vision or like whatever you want to create for yourself. It, it's just as important who you surround yourself with for sure. So you mentioned a couple of other things, you, 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 vision. So are you someone that has a vision? Do you believe in vision boards or vision setting or goal setting or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. My daughter's actually just made as part of one of our COVID crafts, they made their own vision boards, um, which was really cool. I think just um, it's a great lesson in um, abundance and abundant thinking um, and kind of speaking things into reality. I think that you've got to be really focused on where you're going or else like who knows where you're going to end up, right? Right. Um, it's like driving, you know, if you want to go somewhere, it's great to have a map, have an idea of what it looks like when you get there so you can recognize it. Um, and then I also think that it, it really helps um, train our mind out of, um, you know, we can, we can build our own glass ceiling to a degree with um, whether it be our self-worth or what we think we're capable of or what we deserve. But um, vision boarding or having a vision um, allows you to kind of flex your muscles to get out of that space to grow to the next level of person or business person that you need to be to be, do, or have those things. Right. And um, what about you? You also mentioned that uh, um, mindfulness uh, was important to you. So um, why is it uh, that that's how you get in tune with who you are and what you're all about? Yeah, I think I'm having, uh, having an awareness of your mindset and a mindfulness practice does two things. One is you're constantly checking in with yourself to see if like, am I in alignment with where I want to be? And if no, what can I adjust so that I can get there either quicker or smoother or better? Right. And then the other thing it does is it allows space for creativity. And again, that's one of the things that I spoke about in my TED talk about struggle was, um, you know, if you can have some, um, it could be do nothing, it could be just sit in silence, um, it can be meditation, it could be just being out in nature. Um, all of those things allow you to tap into you. So when you can shut down the noise from the outside world and tap into yourself, um, that will allow you to establish um, a really great practice for allowing everything from like ideas and creativity to um, the ability to see the inner work that you maybe need to do um, to grow. Like I said, I think that it's super, super important. It's definitely served me well. You also said that you um, had done some research on narcissism. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, we stumbled on that one by accident. <laughs> um, yeah. So I had a recent, um, relationship it was it was very serious and i think that it it was the ultimate lesson so i'm also um in a dis, in addition to like persistent and resilient i believe you called me yes very stubborn so <laughs> takes me a while sometimes to get the lesson and um you know i think it took a very extreme version of narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder for me to finally see oh like, what's my role in this? Because this is the type of person that I've chosen before, but I didn't really understand that there was like a name for it. And like, I researched, I researched the, you know what, out of it to um, really just get my head around it. So I don't make that kind of a choice again. And it was really, so you had chosen this type of personality once or twice before. Yeah. Yeah. The father of uh, your daughters. Pardon? The father of your daughters? <laughs> Probably both of them to some degree. So with narcissism, just like with autism, let's say there's a spectrum, right? And most people have some degree of narcissistic traits or qualities. It's human ego is part of it. Um, but when you actually get into um, 
and I don't want to play armchair psychologist. I'm just sharing what I've learned through my journey. Um, but when you get into narcissistic personality disorder, that's a whole other level. And there's a lot of psychological abuse. There's a lot of um, manipulation, emotional manipulation, control. They tend to not co-parent, they counter-parent. Um, and, what do you mean by you that? Know, What's counter-parent? They'll, they'll purposefully be destructive um, and manipulative in the, the parent-child relationship um, as well. So for example, with my daughters, they do things on purpose to, let's say, either um, disrupt the relationship between me and the girls or the trust between me and the girls, um, or do things to try to manipulate them as well in an emotional um, capacity. So, uh, so you why know, are you why are you attracted to three different guys? Maybe it's more, but but three different okay. people that are narcissists. Well, what is it about you that likes that? That's a great question. So typically, this is something else that I learned, and this is where the work comes in. Typically, you would have had one or two narcissistic parents growing up that created that. Um, like that's how you feel love is with that type of a, a person or personality. And so like, like somebody who's like overly kind or um, calm or isn't like constantly like, you know, poking the bear or like whatever, um, wouldn't be attractive to you unless you knew to do the work to untangle that stuff. So you don't like kind guys, you only like... <laughs> no, 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 that's the old me. Kind is perfect. <laughs> okay, so, so how did you, again, how did you, how, how did you get through this? You, you said you did research on cancer, you did research on breast implants, you did research on narcissism, what, during yeah. the relationship or after the relationship or both? both? Both, so it's actually what helped me get out of it was um, seeing it for what it really was, which allowed me to build my psychological strength back up because it was like, I didn't even recognize myself towards the end of it. I had so much anxiety and like, you know, I had just gotten out of the drama with the breast implants and like, now here's this person. Great. <laughs> but um, yeah, so part of it was um, advocating for yourself. So doing my own research and the other side of it again was I had a really, really amazing support system. Um, three, four people in particular who um, would just hold space for me to find the information I need and, and get to the place I needed to be at to get out. I think a lot of people lost patience with me because they could see what was going on from the outside. But, you know, I, you know, you can't tell someone in a relationship what to do. You can offer them love and support. You can offer them resources. But until they make that decision for themselves, you can't really do much but be there for them. And I had some really so, wonderful patient friends who did that. So your me. friends didn't come to you and say, this guy's no good for you. They just were there for you. They did. They, they helped me see what it was, but they also weren't expecting anything to happen in an instant. They were just, you know, supportive, amazing people. Here's what's happening. You know, it, seems, uh, it seems surprising to me because every single time I've met you or interacted with you, you've been so positive, so confident, so outgoing, so personable. Um, so that's the draw for a narcissist. So a narcissist is very, very, very drawn to and attracted to an empath. So somebody who is very tuned in, somebody who's very bright and positive, somebody who's doing big things with their life, because it triggers all of the things that makes the narcissist insecure. And so then they piggyback on that feeling and that narcissistic supply from somebody who's an empath like myself. We're chatting tonight with Lavander Morentz, a health and wellness expert, and it's an interesting conversation. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, we're here tonight with Lavander, uh, Lavander Morantz, um, a health and wellness expert, and uh, we've been chatting about a whole bunch of different things. And, and bottom line, I think the, the key to this conversation is that uh, a lot of life is a struggle, and, uh, and all of us have been going through a COVID-19 struggle, uh, as well as you know, race relations have become a big issue, and uh, shoot, just yesterday we had tornadoes come through uh, Mississauga. So you know, there's lots of things that are going on. Uh, and I think, uh, Lavander, people have had you know, public health issues, uh, they've had uh, economic issues, uh, a lot of people have had mental health issues, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of uh, people that have been dealing with sort of social distancing and self-isolation in, in, in lots of different ways. 
Um, you're in the business of health and wellness. How do you help people? Yeah, and I'm so glad you touched on that, Brian, because I think that that is um, a really scary reality of what what's come about with um, all of the social distancing. And there is nothing normal about it as people, as humans. Um, we thrive in community and in contact with each other. Um, and so I do think that the impact on um, mental health has been absolutely huge. And I would say even immeasurable for now, I think we're gonna start to see some of the gravity of it going forward. And especially for kids too, like I've seen it with my daughters, they miss their friends, they miss school, they miss you know the structure of learning. Um, even though we've been doing a lot of our own learning, they do, they miss that community, they miss their social circles. And I do too, I'm not gonna lie, like I'm a very social person um, and we've talked a lot about our relationships and community um, and the benefit of that. And I just, you know, it, it is definitely a big, big part of my business to, to help people through the, the mental side of, of wellness as well. Like our internal world uh, can get turned upside down at the drop of a hat, as we've seen. And, you know, everybody experiences it a little bit differently. So it's good to have some support and some tools. And how do you do that? You do that online. You do that uh, in uh, like, you're not a psychologist. So people don't come to your couch and right, lie down. Well, how do you, how do you counsel people? Yeah. So um, th uh, online, definitely. Um, phone calls, uh, Zoom calls, um, anything like, like that, that's been kind of working for now. I like the idea of a Zoom call because even though you're not physically like with that person, um, you can read facial expressions and you feel um, a little bit more connected than necessarily just on a phone call. Um, the energy comes through a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, like typically I would meet people in person, but with everything that's happened this year, unfortunately that's, that hasn't been an option, but I still want to be available to, to people in any way, shape or form that I can, you know, be of service and, and help people through with the, the difficult times that we've been through. And, and you also counsel people on, uh, on health and so therefore what it's it's diet it's exercise it's things like that yeah it's all of those things um so it's holistic health so it's everything from you know spiritual um mindset uh physical health um exercise uh food supplementation um skin care all of the above and probably you got a couple of calls on uh breast implant uh disease calls or I, I presume some of the given your experience that people that have got problems yeah. with their breast implants are calling you up and uh, yeah, asking for absolutely. counsel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I probably get about 10 messages a week. I'm um, specifically about that. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, Lavender uh, uh, Morantz, thank you so much for joining us. And I really appreciate it. Again, your website is lavendermorantz.com. Yeah. And uh, also you're on Instagram and you're on Facebook. And so I highly recommend you reach out to her. We're going to take one final break and I'm going to come back with some uh, final concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, I've had an interesting conversation tonight with Lavender Morantz and she's got a health and wellness uh, business. And I highly recommend if uh, you've got any of the challenges that uh, she talked about or any others uh, and you're looking for some health and wellness and mindfulness uh, um, expertise in counseling and mentorship, give her a call uh, and or check out her website or check her out on Facebook or Instagram. Um, maybe I can stress three of the things that we talked about. One of them was community. And uh, some of you may know that I'm doing my uh, doctorate uh, right now on social capital and business. Um, so it's the, uh, it's the business side of exactly everything that Lavander talked about. And I think it is one of the critical things that we don't learn in business school and we're not taught often enough um, uh, and how to make those connections, how to to strengthen those connections, how to make those connections authentic and real, um, not uh, uh, transactionally oriented, but long-term relationship uh, oriented. And, and I think that's um, one of the things that have gotten Lavander through her struggles in life. And it's one of the things that get people through not only the struggles in life, but the struggles in business. And so therefore it's key for us to do it. Second thing she talked about, uh, which uh, I think is, uh, is really important is she calls it energy uh, between people. I, I think of it as connectedness between people, but there are people in life that you'll, never connect with and there's other people that you will connect with and and be attuned to that energy be attuned to that connection and know when it exists and uh and 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 strengthen it it's like a muscle and uh, work on it and strengthen it. 
And then the third thing she talked about is that we need to meet people. Um, and I do think that uh, a lot of people have been really impacted negatively by social distancing. And frankly, I think the description of what we're supposed to do has been very uh, detrimental to, to our mental health, um, even though it may have been helpful to our physical uh, uh, or our public health. Um, and so I want you to take out social distancing out of your vocabulary. If you want to replace it with physical distancing, that's okay. But we should be socially connected. You know, my mom, I haven't seen in four months, but we talk and we Zoom and we FaceTime on a very regular basis. And I've done a couple of interviews with her. That's socially close, but physically distant. And so be physically distant, but don't be socially distant. We all need each other, particularly in tough times. Anyway, Lavander, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Thanks, Brian. I had a blast. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Good night.